Well, we are in this series, The Songs of Christmas. We've dealt, well, first of all, three weeks ago with the Song of Mary in Luke chapter 1, 39 to 55. Uh, and then the Song of Zechariah, Luke 1, 67 to 79. The Song of the Angels in Luke 2, 8 to 20. And, and today, Simeon's song. Simeon's song. Who was Simeon? We'll find out momentarily. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles uh, to the passage that was read for us earlier, uh, Luke 2, beginning at verse 21. I hope that you'll have a Bible open, or uh, either a print Bible or on your personal device. Let's bow in prayer together as we enter in. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. Uh, We pray that today you would open it to us by your Spirit, that you would make it live to us, that you would... uh, Teach us that, Lord, you'd open the eyes of our hearts and, uh, Lord, that you'd open our minds to understand the things that you want to reveal to us. Uh, What we know not, teach us. What we have not, provide us. And what we are not, Lord, we pray that you would make us for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom. Amen. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So eight, count them, eight days have passed now since uh, uh, an angel announced the birth of the Savior Christ the Lord to a band of bewildered shepherds outside of Bethlehem, followed by that multitude of of angelic warriors uh, that were praising and worshiping God for who he is and what it was that he was doing in sending his son Jesus. Luke, our narrator, uh, compresses three Jewish rituals into four short verses, verses 21 to 24. And here we're met with the essential Jewishness of Jesus. Do you guys know that Jesus was a Jew? Um, yes, he was. Uh, and as uh, Philip McCallum said a couple of weeks ago, he still is Jewish. And so were his parents, Joseph and Mary. But the first of those rites was the rite of circumcision given by God to Abraham uh, as the sign of the covenant between him, Abraham, and Abraham's descendants forever. It's recorded clear back in Genesis 17, 9 through 14. Every male child born in a Jewish home was to be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. Uh, Any male in the Jewish community who remained uncircumcised was considered to have broken God's covenant and would therefore be cut off, pun apparently intended, from the congregation of Israel. Uh, It was literally cut or be cut. One was not a Jew by birth alone. On the day that he was circumcised, a a boy became a Jew. Uh, Coinciding with circumcision, was the right of naming. There's a little spider running all over my... Strange things that happen during sermons, right? A little friend up here. Uh, Coinciding with with circumcision was the right of naming. And Luke tells us here in verse 21 that, that when he was circumcised, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. As we've seen, the angel Gabriel issued that command uh, to to name him Jesus to both Mary and Joseph individually. And this rite of circumcision and naming would have taken place in either the home where they were staying, uh, the rabbi would come and and perform that rite right there in the home or or in the local synagogue there in Bethlehem. It's important to clarify then that between verses 21 and 22, an entire month passes. And the action moves from the synagogue in Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem. And the likelihood is that Mary and Joseph didn't, you know, in the the interim, make that round trip back to Nazareth um, and then back to, you know, back to Bethlehem or back to Jerusalem. But, But they remained in Bethlehem in anticipation of going up to the temple in Jerusalem for Mary's purification and Jesus' dedication, which were the next two rituals that they were required to perform as observant Jews. In verses 22 to 24, Luke intertwines these two, so let's see if we can untangle them just a little bit. Uh, Beginning of verse 22, And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Uh, We read about the, the law of purification in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 through 8, which none of you have ever read, because when you're reading through the Bible and you come to Leviticus, you just quit, right? But but when a Jewish woman gave birth to a son, she was regarded, she was regarded as ceremonially unclean for a period of seven days. On the eighth day, her son was to be circumcised, and then for the next 33 days, she was again considered unclean unclean. And what that meant was that for 33 days, she couldn't touch anything holy, nor could she enter the temple. But when those days were completed, the law then required that she bring a yearling lamb for a burnt offering to make atonement for her uncleanness. If she couldn't afford a lamb, then the provision for the poor was that they could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons Um, but not a partridge in a pear tree, right? But uh, the priest would then offer those before the Lord, and she would be then clean again. Mary had no little lamb. Luke wants us to know that Jesus was born into poverty, that the purchase of a lamb for sacrifice for that family was simply out of reach. Coinciding then with the ritual of purification was what was known as the law of the redemption of the firstborn, the redemption of the firstborn. According to the law, a firstborn son was holy to the Lord. Think about this. What that means is that that firstborn son literally belonged to the Lord. Luke 2.23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. The presentation of a firstborn son to the Lord in the temple uh, involved a bit more than our child dedication ceremonies involved today. Uh, The law made provision for parents to redeem or to literally buy back their firstborn son from the Lord. God said through Moses, All that open the womb are mine. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. Uh, Also in Numbers 18, the firstborn of man you shall redeem. And their redemption price you shall fix at five shekels in silver, according to the shekels of the sanctuary. In Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read of a woman named Hannah uh, bringing her son Samuel to the high priest. Uh, Eli, in the tabernacle at Shiloh. But instead of redeeming him, Hannah and her husband, Alcana, presented him to the Lord for life. And what that meant for Samuel is that he then grew up in the presence of the Lord under the mentorship, under the tutelage of Eli, the high priest. Samuel became one of the greatest prophets, one of the greatest leaders in the history of Israel. But understand then that On this first foray into the courts of the temple, Jesus is a newborn infant, just 40 days old, carried in the arms of his mother. And there, Simeon was waiting. We need to understand as much as we can about this man, Simeon, because he's the singer of today's song, Um, because of what that song revealed to Mary and Joseph and what it reveals to us today. The beginning of verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, (coughs) excuse me, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Well, Luke introduces us to him first as a man in Jerusalem. And in that sense, he's he's uh, a face in the crowd. Uh, he's neither a priest nor a prophet. 
Um, but he's not just your average face in the crowd. His name is Simeon, according to Genesis 29, verse 33. His name means the Lord has heard. The Lord has heard. The Lord has heard his prayer. And, and for Simeon, the event in his life that Luke records in this passage seems to be the crowning evidence that the Lord had indeed, in, had indeed heard his prayer. Uh, third, Luke tells us that of Simeon that he was righteous and devout. And as with Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1, um, to be righteous doesn't mean to be without sin in this case. What it does mean in context is that Simeon was a man who was conscientious about keeping the law to the best of his ability. Uh, to be devout means that he was all about living a life that was honoring to the Lord. It was the focus of his life. His faith wasn't a matter of uh, mere religion, but rather of, of active cultivation of a personal relationship with God. Simeon was all about that relationship. Next, we're told that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And and here we start getting into some of those uh, unique Jewish phrases, right? Consider the conditions in Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. Israel was occupied by the Romans. Um, Judah was ruled by the crazy King Herod, um, a governor whom the Romans allowed to be called a king. Uh, He was cruel, he was oppressive, he was manipulative, he was coercive, he was vindictive, he was murderous. Um, Caesar once said of of, of Herod that it's safer to be uh, Herod's pig than to be one of his kids uh, because Herod would put his kids to death. The, The scribes and Pharisees had turned Judaism over a period of 400 years from an internalized faith to an externalized religion. The other dominant Jewish sect known as the Sadducees were were corrupt. They colluded with the Romans to retain power in that corruption. Their theology was also corrupted. Their doctrine was corrupted. And so that was the environment. And today Israel is is yet in, in yet another difficult season, aren't they? But even in the darkest of days for Israel, whether politically or spiritually, it's still true today that when the nation has been most unfaithful, one thing has remained true, that God has always preserved for himself a remnant of the faithful, a remnant of the hopeful. And Simeon was numbered among them. Anna, whom we'll meet momentarily, was as well. And together they and others liked them, longed and looked, they waited, they watched for the consolation of Israel, and they encouraged one another to endure in hopeful anticipation. And they knew that the military and political Messiah that most of the nation desired was not the Messiah they actually required. Well, what is the consolation of Israel. My, my online Oxford dictionary defines consolation as comfort or relief in the wake of loss or disappointment. Comfort or relief in the wake of loss or disappointment. Some newer translations spell consolation with a capital C. Maybe yours does. You can check and see, but uh, they do that because the translators understand that the consolation of Israel would neither be an event a crisis moment, nor would it be uh, an epoch. As many Jews today will say, we're, we're not waiting for a personal Messiah anymore. We're waiting for a Messianic age. But the consolation will neither be an event nor an epoch. On the contrary, the consolation of Israel is not a what, but a who. The consolation of Israel would be a person. In fact, Hebrew, in Hebrew, consolation is not a noun, nor is it a title. It's a personal name. And that name is Menachem. Menachem. It means in Hebrew, comforter. Now some of you are old enough to remember a prime minister of Israel in the 70s whose first name was Menachem. Comforter. Simeon was waiting for the one, the one and only, 
whom God had promised would be Menachem, the comforter of Israel. And that's the thrust of the opening lines of Isaiah chapter 40, but that great chapter of messianic hope and promise. God says there, Menachem, Menachem, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Wouldn't that be good news today? And that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. When Menachem would come, he would come with forgiveness. Not just for Israel's enemies, but for Israel. There's something else I want you to see here before we move on. Check out the the word that Luke uses to describe Simeon's waiting. Waiting. Uh, It's the Greek word pros dekomai. And in a literal sense, the word actually means first to receive to oneself, to to welcome. That is to be ready, willing to, to receive what one hopes for. In other words, Simeon was waiting actively. He was waiting expectantly with eyes and arms wide open for Menachem, Messiah, the comforter of Israel, ready to welcome him, ready to receive him, ready to embrace him on that day when he would finally appear. I was reminded in my preparations of a play written by the Irish playwright Samuel Beckett uh, titled Waiting for Godot. It's one of those plays that they tell you in college you should you should see. And uh, I didn't, but uh, I I never forgot that I was told that I should. And so I I found it one day on YouTube and watched it. Um, In that play, Waiting for Godot, two friends, Vladimir and Estragon, are waiting for the arrival of this man named Godot. Neither are certain that they have ever met Godot or whether he will ever actually arrive. And in spite of the word of a few who occasionally show up to say uh, that he's coming, he never does. And in their hopeless waiting, underline hopeless, in their hopeless waiting, here's what happens. Their lives progressively erode into existential despair. Their minds fail. Their characters disintegrate. It's truly one of the most awful, bleak, hopeless, and haunting plays I've ever seen. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It's the kind of stuff that professors say you should watch and fill your mind with. But it represents the precise opposite of the kind of waiting in which we find Simeon engaged. His hoping was not a, was not hoping beyond hope. His, his was a, a confident anticipation of the fulfillment of a clear promise from God. Notice verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's amazing. How God communicated that to him, we don't know, because Luke doesn't tell us, but there it is. And his life from then on was like a giant advent calendar, right? Uh, On which he, he confidently and expectantly counted down the days to that one great day when his eyes would finally behold Menachem, the comforter, God's salvation. Proverbs 13.12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Before we get into Simeon's song in verses 29 to 32, look with me at verses 25 to 27. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. God the Holy Spirit was active in Simeon's life. And each of these three verses tell us something about that. In verse 25, we read that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Upon him. Notice those two words, upon him. Not in him, but upon him. 
The Spirit of God was not given to believers in, in Jesus as a permanent indwelling like we experience today for another 33 years from what we're reading here this morning. On the day, that day of Pentecost, that first day of Pentecost following Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. In Old Testament times, God would place his spirit upon certain people, privileged people, for a specific period of time as a divine enablement to fulfill an assigned task, to fulfill an assigned role. People like prophets and priests and kings and judges. Luke tells us that that was true of Simeon, that the Holy Spirit was upon him. In verse 26, then, Luke tells us that it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. God the Holy Spirit had personally acted to convey this message to Simeon personally. And again, we're not told the means by which God communicated that message to Simeon. Um, God's primary means of communication, of course, is through his word. That has always been true. And it's possible that God spoke verbally then beyond the scriptures to Simeon, either directly or, or, or indirectly or through a prophet. Perhaps the message came as a, a deep yet clear and unmistakable impression. What is clear is that God had spoken. The Simeon had received and was convinced of the trustworthiness of God's communication such that his response had become his response had become the central dynamic, the central driving force of his life from that day forward. And then in Luke, or in verse 27, rather, Luke says that Simeon came in the Spirit, in the Spirit, into the temple. What does that phrase mean? What, what does it mean for someone to be in the Spirit? Well, again, as we, as we trace that phrase in the New Testament, all the descriptions of someone someone being in the Spirit, uh, what becomes becomes clear is that one who is in the Spirit is one who is prepared to prophesy, to speak a word from God, to speak a word for God. Uh, To be in the Spirit, then, is to be prepped to prophesy. And in Simeon, notice, notice notice, notice this man, Simeon. In him we find... A man on whom God has been pleased to allow his spirit to rest. Uh, A man receptive to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. A man available to the Holy Spirit to do and to say what the Spirit requires. How we need men like Simeon today. In verse 27 and following, we read of a a spirit-directed divine appointment. And I think we might be safe in in assuming that that coming into the temple was a daily occurrence in Simeon's life as he waited and watched for Messiah. And on this day, he came in the spirit. The specific, or the, the Spirit was specifically filling him on this day, uniquely filling him, because this day was the day, the day of all days in Simeon's life. On this day, among the crowds in the temple was a particular couple who had come to present their son Yeshua to the Lord. Verses 27 and 28, he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the spirits brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Now, I don't know about you and how you, you know, mentally imagine certain biblical stories. Um, you know, in, in my mind, the field is kind of cleared. It's just Mary and Joseph and Simeon. But that's a totally inaccurate image because uh, crowds of people filled the temple courts every day except for the Sabbath day. Just filled the temple courts all day, every day. 
And amongst all of the babies <laughs> that must have been brought by their parents to the temple that day, we have to wonder how it was that Simeon recognized in the crowd the infant Jesus as the one for whom he had been watching and waiting. It's like a it's like a Where's Waldo picture, right? Where's Jesus? Amongst all the crowds of people, all all of humanity, people have come from all over the known world to, to be in the temple that day. And and mothers and fathers carrying babies, and they're all pretty well wrapped up, right? And and uh, they're swaddled, and, they, they, and what you can see of their faces all kind of look the same. They're just kind of red and squishy, right? So I wonder, did, did Simeon come into the temple that day singing, Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus? Well, maybe. I think that was his prayer every day. Something very close to that, because it could only have been by the Spirit that he didn't miss Jesus. It could only have been by the Spirit that he was first drawn in all of the crowd to Mary and Joseph. It could only have been by the Spirit that he was then able to identify Menachem, Messiah, Jesus. What happens next is that Simeon was prophesying. But before that, I think what happened would have been startling and unsettling to any set of young parents in any generation. A a man probably in his later years, whom they had never met, approaches them with a surprised and delighted look in his eyes and asks if he can hold their baby. And we're not even told that he asked. We're just told that he took the baby in his arms and he started to sing and to bless God. (laughs) Lunatic? Who is this guy? And then they heard what he had to say. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Here's the song. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Past tense. My eyes have now seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon's song was long ago given a Latin title, Nunc Dimittis. Nunc Dimittis. It's kind of fun to say. In the Latin translation of the Old Testament known as the Vulgate, those are the first two words of Simeon's song in Latin. Nunc Dimittis. And they mean, now dismiss. Or, now release. And remember God's promise by the Holy Spirit to Simeon that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon had reached the final day on his personal advent calendar, and he says, Lord, now you are dismissing your servant. You are letting your servant depart in peace. You're releasing your servant from this life. Why? Because what you promised God has now come to pass. It's now come to pass. Does this mean definitively that Simeon was advanced in years and on the verge of death? I always picture him that way. But Luke doesn't tell us that, so we don't know. But what Simeon saw that day was the fulfillment of the promise that had consumed his life. So his life was now fulfilled. And he is saying to the Lord that he's now released, that he's prepared to depart in peace. You know, um, many of us would say, and I've had conversations like this, you know, how do you want to die? (laughs) I I want to die in my sleep, right? We all want that. We all all just want to kind of fade and and, and go to sleep and then wake up in the presence of the Lord. We, We... and and you hear people say as they report people's death, they'll say, well, he died, he or she died peacefully. And we say, oh, that's great. Simeon's saying something a little different. He's saying, Lord, now you dismiss me. You, you, you release me in peace. Why? Because my eyes have seen your salvation. 
My eyes have seen what they've been longing to see. May I suggest to you today uh, that you will not die in peace unless you're at peace with God. Unless you have seen and experienced his salvation. Simeon describes Jesus in three words. Salvation, light, and glory. Salvation, light, and glory. In verse 30, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation. Uh, Jeff Peabody is a, a pastor in Federal Way, a, a sister church of Life Point, And he wrote an article that was published in Christianity Today in which he said this, As Simeon gazed into the brand new eyes of the ancient of days, Christ for him went from being uh, God with us to God with me. Isn't that good? He went from being God with us to God with me. In seeing Jesus, Simeon saw the one who embodied God's salvation and the one through whom God was about to accomplish it. And so Jesus later said of himself, I am the way and the truth, <coughs> excuse me, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter said of Jesus, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So this salvation, Simeon says, has been prepared in the sight of all the peoples, meaning every one, every where. In particular, he says first that Jesus will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles, non-Jews, people like you and me. So this is us, feel included, feel identified. The prophet Isaiah said the people who walked in darkness, that would describe us, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, like the Pacific Northwest, on on them has light shone. I was just kidding. He's talking about spiritual darkness. Gentiles, people without the law, people without the covenants, people without the prophets, people without the promises. We had nothing. And then he says, uh, oh, oh, well, let me back up. The, when you and I, as Gentiles, put our faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the Christ, You and I are joined to the Lord. We're included among his people. Isaiah 56, 3, Let not the foreigner, again, that's you and me, who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And once you're included, when you receive Jesus for who he is, he gives you the right to be called a child of God. And once he adopts you, the adoption is irrevocable. And then he says that the salvation that God is working through Messiah Jesus will be glory, glory for his people Israel. First Samuel fifteen twenty nine, the, the prophet Samuel identifies the glory of Israel as God himself. Glory for your people Israel, God himself. The, the prophets frequently linked the glory of Israel with the coming of Messiah. And both of those make so much sense, don't they? Because in Messiah Jesus, the sovereign creator of God, took on human flesh. Jesus is incarnate God. Jesus is the glory of Israel. When the Israelites finally accept Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah and Christ, Israel itself will experience the ultimate fulfillment of their glory as a nation. Luke goes on in verse 33, And his father and his mother marveled, at what was said about him. I'm so glad Luke kind of inserted this little editorial comment here. I find it refreshing, actually, to read that his father and mother marveled at what was said about Jesus, because I think they might have been a little shell-shocked by now. So much stuff has been going on, you know, and, and, and there's a sense in which they could have just rolled their eyeballs and go, here we go again. Here's another round of this craziness that's happening to us. 
This whole enterprise for them was fresh and new, and, and I wonder if they ever had occasion, I think they probably did, to second-guess things, to second-guess what they thought they heard the angels say. So it's a good thing if the angel said it to both of them, right? Yeah, we both heard it. Uh, second-guessing the decisions they had made regarding Mary's baby, getting married, second-guessing their responses to the gossips and the the rumors about them that were surely making their way throughout Nazareth and and the surrounding little villages where all their relatives lived. I, I think that's a huge part of why they didn't go back to Nazareth right away. They must have frequently felt just off balance and out of their depth. And, and so the words that the Holy Spirit gave Simeon to say to them are not only informative, not only inspiring, but they had to be incredibly confirming and faith-building and resolve-strengthening for both Mary and Joseph. What, what an incredible adventure of faith and, and discovery it was into which God had invited them. And then Simeon's prophecy turns dark. Verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Many through the years have referred to Jesus as the great divider. The great divider. He was appointed for this purpose. He himself said, don't, don't think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword to divide families and marriages and friendships. Something that's been noted by believers down through the centuries regarding Jesus is that once having encountered him, really, really having encountered him, no one can remain neutral. In Isaiah 8, 14 to 15 is written, and he will become a sanctuary. Notice the words he used. He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Notice that to some, Jesus becomes a sanctuary. He becomes a place of refuge, of protection and comfort. To others, he becomes a stone of offense, a a rock of stumbling, a trap, a snare. For those who reject and disregard Jesus, he himself becomes their downfall. He himself becomes their injury, their ruin. But Simeon says that Jesus is also appointed for the rising of many. And the word rising that he uses there is anastasis. Some of you have, you know, uh, read or seen uh, Tolstoy's story, Anastasia. It's the same word. It means resurrection. It literally means to stand up again. It means to be raised from death to life. And I think it calls to reminds the words of the psalmist, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And I think many of you would say, that's my story. That's my story. God God pulled me out of a place I couldn't get myself out of. And I was drowning. I was sinking. And he set my feet. He stood me up. He set my feet on a rock, put a new song in my mouth. See, Jesus was also, Simeon said, appointed as a sign to be opposed. He, he would experience unparalleled hostility, unparalleled contradiction, and as part and parcel of that opposition, uh, uh, the collateral damage, if you will, a sword would pierce Mary's soul as well, he said, a, a clear allusion to the cross where, where she would watch her son suffer and die. Some of you may remember that, that first chapter in, in Revelation where and when we talked about it, we, um, 
the, the image that Jesus saw of Jesus, he, in that image he had a sword coming from his mouth. And we talked about that sword. It was It's a romphia, a particular kind of sword, a fearsome sword, a, a battle sword. Um, that's the same word that Simeon uses here for Mary. He says, your, your, your heart is going to be pierced by a romphia, a, a battle sword, a big old sword, an ugly sword. Jesus was born to die. See, uh, that opposition to Jesus would expose, would reveal the thoughts, the values, the intentions of every heart. One cannot remain neutral regarding Jesus. He will either be the reason for your fall or your rising. You cannot remain neutral. Your response to him will either take you down to a place you'll never recover from or raise you up to a place you'll never want to leave. There was another person there in the temple that day whom we must not leave out. Her name was Anna. Anna was waiting and waiting and waiting like Simeon. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Notice quickly what Luke tells us about her. First of all, she was a prophetess. A prophetess, which means that she was one who spoke the word of God boldly. Her father's name was Phanuel, and she was descended from the eighth of Jacob's twelve sons, Asher. And I think, as I've reflected on this, part of what Luke is telling us about Anna is that she was a nobody. Nobody knows who Phanuel was. Nobody remembers him. The, the tribe of Asher was not of any particular significance. Although the name Asher means happy. She was an old woman. She was advanced in years. There are two ways of interpreting what verses 36 to 37 say about her age. Verse 36 says that she lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. That is from when she was married. And most young women in those days married when they were 15 or 16. So it's likely that she was only 22 or 23 when she was widowed. But the interpretive question comes in verse 37. You can read it just as the the ESV here puts it. And then as a widow until she was 84 and conclude that Mary and Joseph encountered Anna as an 84-year-old widow. But, But it can also Read this way, and then as a widow for 84 years. When you read it that way, Anna may have been as old as 106 or 107 that day when they encountered, when she encountered Mary and Joseph and they encountered her. See, whether she was 84 or she was 107, Anna clearly lived a longer life than the norm for those days. Luke tells us she didn't depart from the temple, meaning that she spent all day every day in the temple courts. And she spent her time there worshiping with fasting and prayer. And uh, when you get a chance, read 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10, because according to the requirements that Paul laid down for Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10, with regard to uh, the, the treatment of widows, the care that was given to widows, Anna perfectly qualified. Anna was the perfect widow. She she checks all the boxes. And she too, seeing the infant Jesus in the temple that day, recognized him for who he is, and, he, and she did two things. First, she broke into worship. Good choice. Second, she broke into witness. She broke into witness. And notice to whom? To all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. What does that tell us? It tells us that there was an entire community of people like Simeon and Anna, 
like Zechariah and Elizabeth, like, if you will, Joseph and Mary, who were waiting quietly, who were were expectant of Messiah's coming, the consolation, the comfort of Israel, the Redeemer of Jerusalem. They were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and praying and watching and listening. Well, how shall we respond to a passage like this one? Uh, The well-worn platitude says that good things come to those who wait. That's sometimes true, that's sometimes not. As uh, J.D. Greer put it, he wrote that that, uh, through their long anticipation and watch for the Messiah, Simeon and Anna show us that Jesus comes to those who wait. To those who wait for him. That's, That's actually always true. Jesus comes to those who wait for him. That was true for Simeon and Anna. It's true for all who will wait on him and wait for him. In an article in the New York Times in October 2021, a writer named Jeremy Green from Johns Hopkins University outlined the the psychic impact of those two tumultuous years of the COVID uh, pandemic, two terrible years. He, He said, what we're living through now, in the aftermath, what we're living through now is a new cycle of collective dismay. A new cycle of collective dismay. I think that's an apt description, don't you? Uh, But I don't think that cycle of collective dismay has yet come to its conclusion. I think instead there's a collective cry of distress in our nation and in our world. It's rising and it's swelling. It's It's a cry for consolation. It's a cry for comfort in the wake of loss and and disappointment. Politically, uh, legally, economically, socially, morally, spiritually, in nearly every area of societal life, whether nationally or internationally, there is a collective sense of dismay, a sense that the wheels are coming off the bus. We look around and we see corruption and injustice at every turn. Very much like the times in which Joseph and Mary, Simeon and Anna lived. Very much like the world into which the Lord Jesus was born. And in these times we wait. And the focal point of our waiting now is is the coming of Jesus, this time, that moment we refer to as the rapture of the church, when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be, we will always be with the Lord. There are two questions that I think we must ask about our waiting. And the first is simply this, are we waiting? Are we waiting? Are you waiting? Does the hope of the coming of Christ motivate your daily life, your your daily thinking, your daily decision making, your daily prioritizations? It's so easy, isn't it? to lose sight of the imminence of his coming when one day is just like the next and the next and the next and the next. We may affirm that he's coming as a matter of doctrinal truth. The the question is whether we affirm it in, in ways that shape our daily living. We can say we believe it, but live as if we don't, as if we're really not sure he will ever come. Paul, having written the words in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, describing the rapture, followed them with this. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Do we? Do you? When was the last time you said, look, hang in there. Jesus is coming. I don't know how to solve your problem, but Jesus is coming. I'll pray for you, but Jesus is coming. Here's a second question. How are we waiting? What characterizes our waiting? How are you investing yourself in this in-between time, between the comings of Jesus 
This in-between time of waiting for Jesus. And I just want to say to you this morning, priority one is being personally ready for his coming. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ so that on that day when he breaks through the clouds, you won't be left behind. You won't be disappointed. You won't be left in that cycle of collective dismay that's going to follow the rapture. Just as our Advent calendars count us down to Christmas, each passing day is part of the countdown to the rapture of the church. There's, there's only one reason that Jesus is delaying, and, and, that, and that's, Peter tells us, that more and more people will turn from their sin and, and put their faith in him. His delay means mercy. His delay means grace. His delay means opportunity. How are you investing yourselves in your families? You know, when Joseph and Mary left the temple that day, they left to invest themselves now in the daunting task of protecting and raising Jesus. With all of the drama that would be involved in that, all of the drama that it would bring to their lives, all of the conflict, all of the difficulty... Let me ask you, parents with children in your home, what drives your parenting? How are you preparing your children so that they, in turn, will wait in readiness for the coming of Jesus? Is that even a priority on your radar? Or are you, like so many parents today, more concerned about academics and sports and social connections? How are you investing yourself in the church? And I'll say it again. One of the things that impresses me so much about Simeon and Anna is that they were waiting in community. When Jesus appeared in the temple in the arms of Mary and Joseph, Anna began speaking of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. When we wait in community, we wait in solidarity. We wait in encouragement to live lives of holiness before him. Why? Because he's coming. He is coming. How are you allowing God to to use you to strengthen your church? We have a desperate need in this church for people who are willing to disciple children and youth, to mentor adults and living a life that's pleasing to him, to to pray for the movement of the Spirit in and through this body of believers. Senior adults. I'm now one of you. There is so much for you to do in these later years of your lives. We've been reading today about two kind of old dudes. Simeon was probably old. Anna, somewhere between 84 and 106, spent her time in prayer, in praise, in proclamation of the word. Simeon made it a point to be in the temple every day. I don't know. I mean, did his legs hurt? Did his back hurt? Did his neck hurt? I don't know. Probably. You know, my dad always said old age is that period of life when Everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work, you know. (laughs) But he made it a point to be in the temple every day, watching, waiting. Lord, is this the day? Are you about to do something? Seniors, are, are, are you anticipating that God might do something? You think he wants to do something in this church? Think he wants to do something through this church? I wonder how many people he was able, Simeon was, was able to encourage simply by being there. By just having a ministry of presence. I wonder how many, you know, he, he would remind that Jesus is coming, that, that the consolation of Israel is just around the corner. He's going to come before I die. And people would look at him and say, you look like you're about ready to die. He must be coming soon. See, many of you seniors are freed up by the retirement from from a career to pursue significance in many avenues of ministry. 
And, and, and it's sad to me when, when the vision of so many seniors isn't anything greater than buying a mobile home, you know, and, and, and going to Phoenix. What's your life about now? Does it still matter? Does it still have significance? Are there still people that God wants to impact through you? I want to encourage you to wait well, to wait strategically, to, to leverage these years in ways that are not merely self-serving, but in ways that are sustaining to others. You are greatly needed. Finally, I want to say a word to you who are hurting today. I'm pretty sure that Anna would say that the story of her life didn't turn out quite the way she would have written it. Being widowed after only seven years of marriage and then spending the duration alone never marrying again. The life of a widow in any generation is not easy. It was particularly so in those days. And maybe for you, as was true for Anna, life hasn't just turned out the way you expected. Maybe you're grieving the death of a spouse. Maybe you're you're grieving the death of a child or a miscarriage. Maybe you're living in the aftermath of a broken relationship or, or lost employment or lost housing. You, you may be struggling in the wake of some injustice that was done against you, and, and you've tried everything you know to try. You've, you've gotten advice, you've prayed, you've believed, you've, you've worked at it, but still things aren't better. I want you to know that God hasn't forgotten you, that God has a, a plan and a purpose for your life. So, you know, some Christians talk about the life of following Jesus as if it means instant fulfillment. And if you do A, then automatically God will do B. It usually doesn't work that way. They say that if you just name it, you can claim it, that if you blab it, you can grab it. You know, And that fits with an impatient, materialistic, self-serving, 21st century American Christian mindset. But God's word calls us to waiting, to waiting on the Lord. And here are a few promises of God for those who wait. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Isaiah 30.18, the Lord longs, longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Isaiah 49.23, those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. In Psalm 9, 9 and 10, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. See, whether you have a a specific need today that you can name, or or just this, this deep yearning for heaven, waiting doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. God sees you. He hears you. He has not forgotten you. He will deliver you at just the right time. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for uh, these examples of Simeon and Anna who model for us the life of waiting on you, trusting in you, confident in your promises, uh, confident in your timing, and in accomplishing your purposes. And uh, Lord, may we uh, emulate them in our lives. And Lord, as we wait uh, for your coming, may we wait in community. May we encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. And may we be ready when you come. And Lord, I pray for those today who have not yet settled that matter, who have... Who, who have uh, nurtured the myth of neutrality. Lord, help them today uh, to see Jesus and, and then so be, so be ready uh, to, to die. So in that way, to be ready for the end of their days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.